Hello, and welcome to a quick introduction to Suture for Surgical Technology students. I'm Mark Sowers. So right from the start, let's clarify something. In medicine, we like to use high-class terms for everything, all right? We don't like to use the everyday terms. We use high-class terms, fancy-sounding terms. So we're not talking about stitches here. That's the everyday term. We use the term sutures. All right, so suture is the high class term that we use in medicine. So in other words, got it? Okay. Now when it comes to suture, there are many, many types of suture, many kinds of sutures, all different sizes and varieties to choose from, and different doctors are gonna have different preferences for the type of suture that they like to use. So I'm gonna to try to help organize this and make it a little bit understandable by categorizing some of the suture types into different sections so you can sort of see how they break down just a little bit. Now, the first thing we should probably talk about is suture size. Now, suture comes in all different sizes, anywhere from really thick diameters to really tiny little diameters, very thin threads that you can barely see. So back in the day when suture sizes were just starting to get standardized, they developed six standard suture sizes that they were going to use, anywhere from uh, just under half a millimeter thick to almost a full millimeter thick, about three quarters of a millimeter thick. So anywhere from 0.79 millimeters down to 0.43 millimeters, six different sizes of those sutures. And they realized that, well, if a doctor is asking for a 0.58 or a 0.65, that's going to get a little confusing. So they decided to make it a little bit more simple. They decided to say, okay, let's just call them size 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's going to make it easier for the people working in the OR to say, this is the size that I want. They started, size 1 is going to be the smallest, size 6 is going to be the largest suture that we have. And for years, that worked just fine. Size one, I need a size one, I need a size six, I need a size four, whatever. All right, but what happened is surgeons started to realize that they wanted something a little bit smaller than a size one, and manufacturers were getting better at making this stuff. So they said, okay, we can make a suture that's smaller than, say, half a millimeter thick. We can make it a little bit smaller than that. But then they ran into trouble because what's smaller than a size one? We don't want to go and change the whole system as we add new and new sutures. So what's all smaller than a size one? Well, okay, we can call that a size zero. All right, so size zero will be the next smallest suture. Well, then they came up with an even smaller suture. Well, what's going to be smaller than a size zero? Well, we could go to like negative one, but that's going to sound weird. A size negative one? What is that? So how about we call it a double zero suture? That's going to be smaller than a zero suture. All right, that works. And then they came up with a smaller suture. That's going to be a triple zero suture and a quadruple zero suture. And you can see where this is going eventually to the point where nowadays we've got 11 zeros. So zero, 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 zero suture. Well, that's crazy now at this point. So we've got to come up with a way of simplifying this as well. And the way we do that is simply by counting the number of zeros. So that suture with 11 zeros, we're just going to call it an 11O suture, 10O suture, and all the way down to 2O suture. Now, zero, that's just going to be 1O, so that's just zero. And then, of course, the standard 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So 6 being the largest, down to 0, and then all the way down to 11O, which is the smallest, very, very tiny suture that you're going to see. So just how tiny are we talking? Well, take a look at this. This is a human hair running up and down the screen right there. And you can see suture sizes compared to that human hair. Human hair is about the equivalent of a 7O suture. It's about the same diameter. All right, but down to 11O suture, which is really tiny, that thing's about a third of the diameter of a human hair. Imagine, very, very tiny and very, very hard to see, especially with my old eyes. It's really hard to see a suture that's a third of the size of a human hair. So then imagine if they turn out the lights in the room because you're doing a laparoscopic or a microscopic surgery, and all of a sudden it's dark in there. Well, you're not going to see this tiny little suture at all. So that's why having really good eyesight, especially when working with these very tiny sutures, is going to be very helpful.
So let's see if we can classify some of these types of sutures. And sutures can generally be broken down into a couple of different types. So the first way of breaking down or classifying suture would be whether it's absorbable or not. So most suture is either absorbable or non-absorbable. Now, what, what are we talking about here? So absorbable suture is going to be broken down by the body. The enzymes in the body are going to react with the suture material itself and eventually break it down and dissolve it. So it eventually gets absorbed by the body. So that suture is eventually going to go away over a couple of days, usually a couple of weeks, it'll get absorbed by the body. Non-absorbable suture, on the other hand, is not going to get absorbed by the body. It's going to stay there. It's going to stay there pretty much permanently. So non-absorbable suture is really long lasting. So why do we have these two different types? Well, for example, if you're suturing the skin, it's easy enough to come back a little bit later and have the suture removed. But if you're suturing somewhere deeper in the body and you suture it closed, you don't want to have to go in a couple weeks later, open it back up to try to get those sutures out. You want those sutures to sort of dissolve naturally. So that's a good example of where you would use absorbable suture. Or maybe if you don't want the patient to have to come back into the doctor's office to have the sutures removed, even if it's in the skin, you can use absorbable sutures and they'll eventually sort of dissolve away on their own. So usually you're going to see absorbable sutures used probably deeper in the body or in places where the doctor just doesn't want the patient to have to come back and have those sutures removed. Usually this is going to be used on soft tissue that heals rapidly. So very soft tissue that has a lot of blood flow through it. It's going to heal very quickly. The suture doesn't have to hold it together for very long. Those are areas that you're going to use absorbable sutures. But there are some cases where you might use a non-absorbable suture where it would be important to do so because you don't want that suture to absorb or dissolve too quickly. So for example, let's say you're suturing two arteries together and you're anastomosing these arteries. That's the fancy term for putting them together. All right, so you're going to suture them together. Well, these arteries are now under high blood pressure. The blood's flowing through there. It's high blood pressure. You don't want these sutures to dissolve away too quickly before the blood vessel has a chance to heal. Because if the suture then dissolves and the blood vessel hasn't healed yet, well, then it's going to burst and that's going to create a lot of problems and you don't want that to happen. So usually on blood vessels, especially arteries, you're you're going to use non-absorbable suture that's just going to stay there for a really long time, hold those blood vessels together just in case. Another example where you might use non-absorbable sutures would be for tissues that don't necessarily have a whole lot of blood flow to them, so they heal very slowly, such as tendons. Tendons are a great example of this. Tendons, ligaments, things like that, not very much blood flow in them. They're very tough material and they heal very, very slowly. It takes weeks, months even for these to heal. And tendons and ligaments tend to have a lot of pressure put on. There's a lot of stretching put on them. So you don't want the suture to sort of dissolve away and have the tendon, whatever little bit has healed, suddenly pull apart. So you're going to use a non-absorbable suture that's going to hold that tendon together for a really, Really, really long time. And one other case where you might use non-absorbable sutures, even on skin, you could do this. If you have a patient, let's say they're staying in the hospital for a long time and they're getting constant care, and there's always going to be a doctor or nurse there to remove any sutures that might be there, you can use non-absorbable sutures then because they're fairly easy to take out. So one way of classifying sutures is absorbable versus non-absorbable. Another way of classifying suture looks at the filament. Now, what we mean by filament is we're looking at the thread itself, what the thread itself is made up of. All right, so thread, suture thread can be made up of a monofilament, meaning a single strand of solid material. Think of a nice solid wire. It's just a solid one strand material. That's monofilament. But sutures could also be made up of many very thin, tiny filaments sort of woven or even braided together, more like a rope rather than a wire. So you have many tiny strands that are woven or braided together to create a multi-filament suture. So you can imagine that monofilament versus multifilament sutures are going to have different properties that are going to make them more advantageous in different situations. So let's take a look at some of the different properties between monofilament and multifilament sutures. The first property is that monofilament sutures tend to have something called memory. 
Now, memory means that it likes to retain its shape. It doesn't bend or change its shape very well. Whatever shape it came in is the shape it's probably going to stay in. It wants to stay in that shape. Here, I'll give you an example. This is monocryl suture. Monocryl suture. So this is a monofilament suture, and you can see how it's wavy here, goes back and forth. It's holding its shape that it had in the package, so it doesn't just hang nice and neat. It sort of waves back and forth, if you can see that. So this suture has memory. It remembers the shape that it was in while it was in the package, and that means you can try to stretch it out, and it sort of sproings back. Sproing is a technical term. It sort of sproings back, holding that shape. That's sort of a feature of monofilament suture. Whereas this is Vicryl, which is a popular suture you're going to see a lot of. And notice it just sort of hangs there straight down. It doesn't have a lot of memory. Yeah, down here towards the bottom, maybe a little bit. But generally, Vicryl, which is a multi-filament suture, is just going to hang nice and smooth. It's going to drape wherever you take it, okay? So it's going to act like a nice, easy-to-use thread. And this ease of use is one of the advantages of a multi-filament suture. So while handling monofilament suture, which has that memory, which likes to sproing back into its original shape, it can be a little challenging. Where it really comes into play is when you're trying to tie the knot. You're trying to suture and tie that knot together and make that knot hold. So what happens is that suture that has memory doesn't tend to knot as tightly as suture that doesn't have memory. It tends to want to spring back to its original shape, and the original shape was not in a knot. So it wants to open that knot back up, which makes these knots not quite as tight as they otherwise would. And surgeons who use monofilament suture are usually going to throw several knots. They're going to knot it, and then they're going to knot it again, and then knot it again, and knot it again, in order to make sure it really holds, because monofilament doesn't tend to hold those knots quite as well as multifilament suture does. Multifilament suture, because it doesn't care what shape you put it in, it's going to knot nice and tight, and it's going to hold that knot really good. So that's one of the advantages of multifilament over over monofilament in this case. It holds its knot better. But when it comes to bacteria, and bacteria is a bad thing, when it comes to bacteria, the monofilament is actually has the advantage. So if we look at a close-up view of a monofilament suture here, you can see that it's real smooth. It's just one strand of suture there, and it's real smooth surface. Now, bacteria really likes little nooks and crannies, little places to hide from the immune system. And monofilament suture doesn't really have this. It's so smooth that the immune system can get to any bacteria that might happen to form on there. Whereas multifilament suture, because of all those tiny little threads woven and braided together, well, there's lots of little nooks and crannies in there for that bacteria to hide in. And the immune, the immune system can't get in there to get it. So what happens is multifilament suture shouldn't be used in areas of infection because that infection can tend to very quickly grow in that suture. The immune system can't clean it out. And then it's going to tend to follow that suture all the way along that suture line. The bacteria are going to follow it all the way along that wound, infecting now the entire wound because they're protected by that multifilament suture. One other advantage of monofilament over multifilament is that because it's so smooth, it tends to just glide through the material. So let's say you're suturing a very tiny little blood vessel, a very soft, very delicate blood vessel, and you take your monofilament suture, and it's just going to pull right through, and you can pull that suture through the little hole that you've created, and it's just going to glide right through there, not causing any damage to the tissue of that blood vessel. Whereas a multifilament suture tends to be rougher. It has all these little edges and little nooks and crannies on it. So as you're pulling it through that very delicate tissue, it's going to tend to catch and drag on that. And it's going to tear it a little bit. It's going to create a little bit larger opening. And when we're talking about blood vessels, we want that opening around that suture to be nice and tight. So usually when we're talking about blood vessels, we're going to use a monofilament suture because it's not going to drag. It's not going to create friction as it pulls through that tissue. So those are two different ways of classifying suture. We can classify it whether it's absorbable or non-absorbable. We can classify it whether it's monofilament or multifilament. And those two different types of classifications can sort of mix and match. One isn't linked to the other in any way. So we can make a grid here of the different combinations that we could have. We have absorbable monofilament suture. And here's a couple of examples, monocryl, 
PDS, plain gut, chromic gut. We're going to get to what these are in a minute. Those are absorbable monofilament sutures. Whereas you can also have non-absorbable monofilament sutures. Those would be, say, proline, Gore-Tex, surgical steel. Yes, stainless steel. They make suture out of thin threads of stainless steel. Or ethylon, which is sort of a nylon, like your nylons that you wear, kind of stretchy suture there. So ethylon is a non-absorbable monofilament suture. But then you can also have absorbable multifilament sutures. And a good example of this would be Vicryl. Vicryl is a real popular suture. You're going to hear about that one a lot. So Vicryl or Vicryl Rapid is going to be an mu absorbable multifilament suture. And then if you want a non-absorbable multifilament suture, you can use something like Ethabond or Silk. So again, there are many, many different types and names of sutures out there. These are just some of the more popular ones, some of the more common ones that you're going to see in the hospitals. So we're just going to cover a few of these just to give you a little introduction to some of the more popular, more common suture that's out there. One of the original types of sutures, suture that was used hundreds, thousands of years ago, is gut suture. This is suture, it's called gut because it's made out of, you know, guts. It's made out of sheep or beef intestines, and they cut them into very thin strips, and this thin strip is then used to suture wounds together. So this plain gut, or sometimes called cat gut, don't worry, it's not actually made out of cat guts. You think of it more as a shortened cattle gut. So cat gut, or in this case, just plain gut suture is made from beef or sheep intestines and put into a single thread. So cat gut or plain gut suture, intestine suture is absorbable. Now, some manufacturers actually start out by taking several different threads of this gut tissue and sort of winding them together, but then they grind them and smooth them out so it becomes very smooth and very monofilament-like. So gut suture is generally considered monofilament, and again, it is absorbable. And this suture is going to be used in areas with lots of really good blood flow that's going to heal very, very quickly. Often use the digestive system, especially the upper digestive system, System. Think the mouth, the tongue, the lips, things like that. Or even places like a circumcision that, again, has a lot of blood flow. It's going to heal very rapidly. Plain gut suture is often used in these areas. Now, because of the natural fibers, we don't want them to dry out. This suture is actually packaged in a little alcohol mix. So when you open it up, the suture itself is moist. It's wet and it's alcohol-based. So it has a fairly strong odor or smell to it. So you're definitely going to notice when you're using a gut suture. Now, plain gut suture happens to dissolve or absorb very rapidly. Usually in just a few days, it can break down and start to break off. But if you want it to last maybe a little bit longer, you want it to hold a little bit longer, what the manufacturers do is they treat this with chromic salts. So now you have chromic gut suture. And because of these chromium salts that are mixed in with the alcohol that treats this suture, it's still going to be wet. It's still going to have an odor. But because of the chromium salt, it's going to last a little bit longer. So maybe it'll last a few weeks rather than just a few days. But then new modern manufacturing techniques have allowed us to use certain different types of plastics to make our suture. So a monocryl is a type of plastic absorbable monofilament suture. And it has very similar properties to the chromic gut suture. It's just synthetic, okay? It's a plastic type of suture. It's good for use for approximating or bringing together soft tissues. Again, it has a lot of blood flow to it. It's going to heal very rapidly. And again, because it's monofilament, it's going to have memory. It's going to sproing back. And it's going to be a little bit harder to tie a knot in. Another type of suture is PDS suture, or PDS2 in this case. So PDS just defines the type of chemical, the type of plastic that makes it up. So different types of plastic, different polymers make up different types of sutures, and PDS is one of those types of sutures. Now, one of the neat things about the suture packaging is that it'll often tell you what you need to know about it. Here it says monofilament, and here it says absorbable. So PDS is a monofilament absorbable suture, and you can find that right on the packaging. One very popular type of suture is called proline. Now proline is monofilament, so it has a really good memory, 
but it's non-absorbable. It's going to last a long time. In fact, surgeons like to talk about patients that they had a long time ago. They did a surgery on that patient. They put in some proline. 10 years later, the patient comes back for a different surgery. Surgeon opens them up and sure enough, there's this bright blue monofilament suture still sitting there just like it was the day it was put in. Even 10 years later, it hasn't broken down. So proline is a very long lasting, it's a bright blue suture. That's a way to remember that one. Now, proline has many uses. You're going to see it used a lot of places, but because it's non-absorbable, one of the good uses for it is to hold surgical mesh in place. Let's say you're repairing a hernia and you got to put some mesh in there to cover up the opening to make sure that things don't protrude where they're not supposed to. And you're going to suture that in place using proline, which is going to stay there for a long time and really hold that mesh in place for a long time. That's a good example of using proline inside the body. Another example would be because it's monofilament and non-absorbable. It's really used very often on vascular procedures, on procedures on blood vessels. So you're going to suture the blood vessel closed, and because it's nice and smooth, it's not going to tear the tissue, and because it's non-absorbable, it's going to stay there and hold that blood vessel closed for a very long time. Now, one of the most commonly used types of sutures that you're going to see is called Vicryl. Vicryl is used in lots and lots of places. Get used to Vicryl. You're going to see this everywhere. And because Vicryl is so popular, people who write test questions like to ask a lot of questions about it. So one of the things they like to ask is, okay, it's made up of plastic. It's made up of a type of plastic, a polymer. Well, what exactly is it made up of? So knowing that Vicryl is made up of polyglactin 910. I know that's kind of a mouthful. Polyglactin 910, knowing that that is the polymer, the type of plastic that makes up Vicryl, is really going to help you out. I'm telling you, memorize that one right now. Polyglactin 910 is another name for Vicryl suture. Now, Vicryl suture is absorbable and it is multi-filament, so it doesn't have that memory. You can tie a nice tight knot with it, and it will absorb eventually. So a good use for this is, say, for example, if you're doing an abdominal surgery and you're closing up the abdomen, well, you, you start by suturing down deeper in the belly, in the abdomen area, and you're going to suture the fascia and some of the peritoneum together. You're going to use an absorbable suture because that's going to heal fairly quickly, but you don't want it to be there 10 years later. You want it to sort of absorb into the body. So that's a good use, general soft tissue approximation. Approximation means brain it together. So general soft tissue approximation for is a good use for Vicryl suture. Now Vicryl suture is usually dyed purple. So if you see purple suture, it's usually going to be Vicryl suture. But Vicryl is also available undyed, meaning it doesn't have that purple in it. So in that case, it's usually a white suture. So another very common type of suture is silk. Now, silk is a natural suture. It's made out of silk from, you know, silkworms that create silk. And they take all these little threads that the silkworm has created. And, of course, they clean them up, you know. But they'll wind them and braid them together. So this is a braided suture. It is multi-filament. They'll wind it up into this nice thin thread. And then they'll usually dye it black. So that's how you can tell silk suture is dyed black. So this is a multi-filament, non-absorbable suture because silk is going to last a long time. Even in the body, it's going to last a long time. So silk is multi-filament because of all those tiny little silk threads and non-absorbable. It's going to last a long time. Another common use for silk suture is to attach drains. Now, usually we put a little tube, a little drain into a wound to let that soda drain out any fluid that builds up in that wound. It's going to drain out through this little tube. That's a drain. And then we're going to suture that into place temporarily with silk suture, which is going to hold it there until, you know, once the wound stops draining, then we can take all that out. Now, there's a couple of things to remember about silk suture. Number one is that it is multi-filament, and because it's multi-filament and it doesn't absorb, it doesn't break down, it's just there for a long time, that means you never want to use it in the presence of an infection. If you've got an infection, it's going to get into that silk suture, and because it's around forever, it's just going to follow that silk suture all the way through that wound, and it's going to create a lot of problems. So never use silk suture in the presence of an infection. And silk suture tends to cause inflammation of the skin. So you probably don't want to use silk suture in skin, at least leaving it there for a long time, because it is going to cause inflammation in skin tissue. 
So that's just a few of the many, many types of sutures out there. And you're going to hear about many more of these, but these are some of the more common ones that you'll hear about. So just sort of a quick introduction to those. So we've talked about the suture, the thread itself. But now let's talk about the needles that come on the ends of those threads. And just like there are many, many different types of suture threads, there are many, many different types of needles that can come on the ends of these suture threads. Now we're not going to cover all of these, but I will tell you some of the general classifications of needles. They come in sort of four different major types, and there are many other types, but four different major ones that you're going to see. And one type of needle is the taper point needle. Now think of this as a sewing needle. It's a round needle. It's got a round sort of diameter to it. And then it tapers down to a nice sharp point. So a round needle that tapers to a point, that's going to be a taper point suture needle. Now, Different from that is you can have still a round needle, but it's sort of a softer, blunter point. It's not a real sharp point. It's got a blunt point. So this is going to be a blunt point needle. And the reason you would have this is if you're going into very soft, very delicate tissue, you want it to sort of pull through nice and gently. You don't want to cut through that and it's going to cause it to tear. So a blunt point needle you'll use through very soft, very friable tissue. There's another word you're going to hear. Friable tissue means it's very soft. It pulls apart very easily. And in those cases, you're going to use a blunt point needle. Now, the opposite of that, if you have some really tough tissue, let's say some fascia, which is kind of like gristle, it's real tough, or even skin in many cases can be tough, you're going to use something called a cutting needle. Now, instead of, say, the sewing needle, which is nice and round and easy to hold, a cutting needle happens to be in more of a shape of a triangle, and it's got, along the shaft of the needle, it's got these three points, these three edges that are really sharp all the way along the needle itself. So as you throw it through the tissue, it's gonna cut through that tissue because it's gonna be really tough tissue. So it's gonna easily cut through it, allowing you to pull that needle through there. So these three sharp edges along the shaft of that needle make this a cutting needle. And a conventional needle has one of those blades on the inside curve of that needle. Now, what they've realized is that having a blade on the inside curve might be a bad thing because it tends to make this tissue tear in the direction that this thread's eventually going to be pulling. So then they created a reverse cutting needle, which is going to have that third sharp side on the outside of the curve, which means the thread's going to be pulling inward, but that tear is going to go outward. So it's going to help to hold that thread, that suture in place a little bit better. So a conventional cutting needle and a reverse cutting needle would be the other two types of needles that you're going to see. So there are four main types. Again, there are many others. There are curve, real tight curves, and there are straight needles and lots of different things that you can learn about. But these are the four main main types of needles that you'll see out there. Now, if all of this sounds really confusing, I do have some good news for you. The good news is that most suture packaging comes with really good labeling on it. So you can find what you're looking for just by reading the label. And that's pretty cool. For example, here we've got some ethylon suture and it's got all kinds of information on it. Notice the biggest thing that it says is the gauge. It's 5-0 suture. So it's kind of a small suture, a 5-0 suture. That's the size of the diameter of the suture thread itself. It tells you the type of suture. It says ethylon on it, and it tells you the type of plastic that makes up ethylon. In this case, it says polyamide 6. So that's the type of plastic, the type of polymer that makes up this suture. That's the material that the suture is made out of. It tells you about the needle. In this case, we have a reverse cutting needle. It shows you the size and the length of the needle. And needles come in different codes, so you can identify them quickly. In this case, it's a PS2 needle. That's a very specific type of needle. You're going to be learning more about that as you go along in your coursework. The image of the needle shows only a single needle, so there is only one needle on this suture. Sometimes you can find suture that has a needle on each end of the suture, so there's going to be a picture of two needles on there. That'll tell you how many needles are attached to this suture. It also shows the suture length. So the length of the suture string itself, in this case, it's 18 inches long. It says 18 inches here. So it's about 18 inches long. You can have suture that's shorter. You can have suture that's a much longer, maybe three feet, 36 inches long. So different lengths to the suture is going to be indicated here. And probably the most important thing, the expiration date. You always want to check the expiration date of your suture before you use it. And the expiration date is going to be printed on every single package of suture. 
So that's just a quick introduction to suture that's used during surgery. There is a lot of information here. There's a lot more to learn. You're not gonna learn all of it during your coursework. Most of it you're gonna sort of pick up as you go through the clinical sites. And even after you graduate, you're gonna be learning much, much more as you start to use these different types of suture, different types of needles over and over. You're gonna start to get a feel for it. You're not gonna know everything all at once. Don't worry about that. Just try to do your best. Understand the main categories of suture, the main categories of needles and you're probably going to be okay and you sort of build from there. So good luck on your studies of suture.